So my name is Meredith Blaise. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for Volunteering WA, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to today's session and thank you for joining us. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to Elders past and present. I flew in from Perth yesterday and it was just so lovely coming from all the brown to see all the green and the rush, <laughs> sort of lush rolling hills around Canberra. It was really beautiful country. So this morning's session will be focused on three presentations around environmental volunteering. So we're going to explore the critical role that volunteers play in conservation and addressing environmental challenges. We'll look at the underlying research which is informing these programs and we'll also share practical strategies from volunteer leaders and coordinators who are active in the environmental sector. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Fiona Tucker. Fiona is a manager of visitor programs for Sydney Olympic Park Authority. She has 25 years professional experience in delivering of natural and cultural heritage visitor programs. Alongside this experience, uh, she also volunteers with Girl Guides New South Wales, ACT and Northern Territory, uh, both as a district manager and also as a kayak canoe skills instructor. Multi-talented volunteering people are. Fiona leads a highly customer focused team at Sydney Olympic Park as they transform from being a place to visit to also being a place to live. Please join me in welcoming Fiona to our stage. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Meredith. Um, I'm Fiona and I'm a volunteer. Uh, I also am talking to you today about uh, the work we do at Sydney Olympic Park, um, so where I work with volunteers. Uh, to start, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal, whose land we are on today, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future, and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here with us today. The project I'm sharing with you today started as a seed of an idea following my attendance at a conference five years ago. A state parks agency there presented a case study about a community reserve that was um, with contributions from community volunteers, local school students and park staff was transformed from a really degraded, vandalised place into a valued community park. What I took away from this was that a community was invited into a place to care for it alongside the agency responsible for managing that area and that it wasn't just a one-off clean-up day but a complete package with both environmental and social outcomes for the local community and that ongoing custodianship was achieved for that small precious pocket of parkland. And it got me thinking and then I headed back to work and the idea was set aside to brew for a while. I work at Sydney Olympic Park um, when you heard me say that, or when you heard introduction, you probably just went, oh yeah. What, so I ask you, what did you think of? Perhaps your mind goes straight back to the excitement of the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games, or perhaps a more recent excursion to the Sydney Royal Easter Show or a sporting event or concert, or if you're a Sydney cider, lining up for your vaccination. While Sydney Olympic Park is a major events and entertainment precinct, the 640 hectare site has a mix of land uses that include parkland, nature reserves, environmental conservation, along with areas for public recreation, sports and events, residential and business uses. To give you some context to the park, I just want to go back in time um, to the beginning before the year 2000. Sorry. Go. Um, no, nope. now I'm right. So Sydney Olympic Park rests in Wongal country on the southern shore of the Baramadigal or Parramatta River. For, for millennia, it's been home to the Wongal and a resource rich gathering place for the First Nations people where they'd meet, celebrate, and trade. Uh, since 1788, colonial, industrial and military uses have seen the destruction of the natural landscape, including polluted and uh, created a polluted industrial landscape. 
And with the vast site that was needed to host those Sydney 2000 Olympic Games and Paralympic Games, the land was reclaimed, remediated, and a parkland was re-engineered to contain and manage the 9 million cubic metres of waste. So sustainability was embedded in the development of the venues and delivery of the Games, earning our Olympics uh, the title of the Green Games. As a result, the natural environments were protected, including Sydney turpentine ironbark forests, salt marsh and mangroves, and habitat was protected for threatened species, which included this vast list here, um, which is a bit like the 12 days of Christmas when you rattle through it. Um, I'm really trigger happy with this thing. Um, Sydney Olympic Park is well known as a home for elite sports and entertainment facilities, with events bringing over 10 million visitors annually through the suburb for more than 5,000 events, and 50 of those days are considered major event days, with more than 30,000 event patrons attending. In 2021, the park had 13,000 regular workers and 5,000 casual staff and 5,800 residents. So Sydney Olympic Park's located between Sydney's um, two largest employment centres, the CBD and Parramatta. And by 2030, it's estimated that 23,000 people will live at Sydney Olympic Park and the park will be connected by the uh, Metro West line, a new station on that line. Currently, our residents are young, median age of 31 years. They're two thirds of sinks or dinks. Uh, they're ethnically diverse with three quarters of the households speaking another language other than English. And a lot of the residents, a majority own a car, 17% own two and 12% don't drive. And many are renting and work in those two employment centres. All homes in and surrounding Sydney Sydney Olympic Park are high density, so most are secure, where residents access their floor only, and so people are somewhat disconnected from their neighbours. Uh, with almost all land under public ownership and the impending arrival of the Metro, future development can aspire to tackle issues of housing affordability and equality, climate change, and create a place that is more focused on every day, not just large scale events. So that's a clear shift from the current to the future for Sydney Olympic Park. Importantly, in all the research that's gone on, community and health and well-being and the environment sit right at the heart of it. Um, extensive community consultation um, has been undertaken and to create our new vision, which is Sydney being Sydney's Sydney Olympic Park being Sydney's beating green heart. And identified opportunities for us to uh, provide uh, opportunities for people to connect and care for country and connect with each other. Uh, some of the research um, undertaken um, indicated that some desired outcomes include creating an informed and connected community, um, having activations that contribute to a local community and building um, custodianship in the community. And so one clear outcome for us was to investigate setting up a community volunteering program and in, um, develop volunteer initiatives that would help build local custodianship. So volunteering isn't something new to the park. Volunteers have played a role since the Games. Volunteers are a huge part of that. And our existing volunteer opportunities continue to play an important role. In the last 2021-22, uh, volunteers gave 878 hours to our eco friends and our park care programs. So eco friends is a program supported by partner organisations who volunteer members work alongside our ecology and environment team conducting surveys and that data contributes to the data sets that help us manage the parklands. And Park Care Program, uh, one my team manages, was basically environmental cleanups uh, led by our park rangers. Uh, participants are usually drawn from community and corporate groups seeking a community service or team building opportunities, along with casual attendees. But it wasn't an ongoing commitment from a volunteer. So our proposal was to establish a new Park Care Program that would foster custodianship of the parklands, wetlands and waterways of Sydney Olympic Park within the growing local community. And we've called this Neighbours Nurturing Nature. The project um, concept centres on the three waterways that are found there, um, Parramatta River, Haslam's Creek and Powell's Creek, three communities within the greatest Parramatta Olympic Peninsula being Newington, Wentworth Point and Sydney Olympic Park, and also our three local schools in those suburbs. 
The project scope includes raising awareness of the value and importance of natural spaces and involving the community in activities that will contribute to improving habitat value, biodiversity health and amenity of the project areas. Now to deliver this project, um, we need support uh, from within our organisation, from the different teams, uh, alongside trusted contractors and like-minded community organisations, um, including not-for-profit groups such as Parramatta River Catchment Group. Um, the project would extend an invitation to our community to connect over a place in the park, just like that idea I heard about. Um, we'd invest in with them improving the amenity and habitat of that area and foster um, the sharing of skills and knowledge between people in the group. Some protect, um, potential areas um, impacted by human activities and with low habitat value are identified um, as suitable places with consultation with our ecology and environment team. And some of our proposed activities, you can see there on the right, uh, everything from removing litter and doing litter audits, enhancing habitat through creating habitat boxes, weeding and planting of endemic species, water quality monitoring, and then other things such, such as engagement through programs and creating places for kids to play with back to basic nature play, not in our habitat areas where we often would find them um, and, and that would really annoy the ecology team. Um, and also walks and talks and incorporating um, this into our junior ranger program. Um, so aside from improving habitat, we also felt um, there's other outcomes that participants would feel a connection to the area and also a connection with each other. And we know that once people connect with each other, that supports other social outcomes, such as friendships amongst the new residents in the area, opportunities for people of non-English speaking background to talk in English and improve their English skills, connect isolated people who are feeling lonely, um, just and also connecting us as a management agency of the park to the community. And we have a little model here where we start with the volunteer as the centre. We're giving them permission to come into the place. We provide induction and training so they're safe. Um, they improve the area. We, we see a change in behaviour. Um, we monitor, extend our project and share. And we just keep going around in that circle. That's the idea. Um, success of the project will be measured long term through increased biodiversity. Five links and also um, through regular field surveys and volunteers meeting regularly and successful implementation of some nature play. We also had a different model, a slightly adaptive for schools, uh, basically working with one year in that school that passed the project to the next. Uh, so we sought um, support from our organisation. Uh, we also sought some funding because we realised that uh, we need someone to get the project established to solely focus on that. Now, as you know, approach, uh, applying for a grant is a bit like a chicken before the egg. You've got to have everything worked out in fine detail before you can submit your application. And then, um, you know, it's a bit like buying a lottery ticket and daydreaming that you might actually be able to pull this thing off. So in um, late 2021, we did receive a grant from the Environment trust of New South Wales and also some in-kind funding support from our organisation. We had a busy year last year implementing the project. Um, we recruited an assistant project officer and connected with other program managers for volunteer programs in Department of Planning and Environment, which we sit within. We created an EOI on our community um, engagement platform and to invite the community to come and find out about our project and share ideas. Um, and we delivered our first year pilot with both schools and communities. And then we sat down and evaluated and we've just resumed activities for this year. So what did we get up to? So the area we trialled was a little area called Till Pond. It's right up the north west corner, got that wrong, um, southwest corner of Sydney Olympic Park, right near the M4, a small area right next to the homes in Newington. Uh, it was an area everyone was happy with. Um, we couldn't do too much damage if we got it wrong. Uh, we undertook fauna surveys, photographic surveys, um, created risk assessments, worked out a code of conduct that would uh, comply with our the acts we need to comply with in managing the environment and kept our environment and ecology team on side. We really had to build trust with them. Um, we also worked with uh, 
a school. We had two visits from Newington Public School out to the site for a site survey where they did some line drawings, good geography stuff, a litter clean up and planting. And we have been holding monthly community sessions for weeding, the surveys, litter collection and planting and watering. Uh, is our site and you can see the nice weeds at the edge of the pond. That was the first target area they looked at. Uh, and also this bush area around that site. So that's our volunteers out doing weeding. We're just targeting specific pest uh, weeds, not every weed. And you can see the front of the pond had been cleared, ready. And um, we've got contractors help with some of the heavy work there. And there's our school kids out planting. Um, they were great. Sierra, just before Christmas, um, we had to put signs up to tell people to leave it alone because locals come and try and fish in that pond. And um, there's us just a few weeks ago pulling the um, protective cartons off and letting the plants have a bit more light. So um, quickly go through the challenges. Um, administration was really slow to get going for us, especially when our organisation is moving to an outsourced services model. So we're going through a government realignment that was pretty hard and kept hitting walls. Um, keeping to the concept that we were funded for was really hard. While we wanted to incorporate ideas from the community, we, we'd already had this plan approved to get the funding to have someone to make the thing happen. So that just means variations have to go in um, for what our project looks like. And also being honest and putting some ideas aside for later. Um, and some, yep, one minute, good. Uh, also, um, maintaining the volunteers' motivation because um, some of them were wanting to improve habitat areas right behind their homes, but we found that those areas were fire protection zones and um, all green and golden bellfrog habitat, which we aren't allowed to play in. Um, also, navigating the rules and ownership of the parklands. We have two different teams, landscape and um, the environment and ecology team who manage the areas in different ways and just getting them on board um, and let, building trust with them so they would let us we're really the tours staff and the customer engagement side of the team. Um, let us go out and play with the weeds and plants and spend time with us, invest in us. Um, also fitting in with the local school's timelines, so I was struggling with staffing. Pandemic concerns still amongst the volunteers. Volunteers being young, because our population's young, you invest in them, <coughs> they move away, they've got a new job. Um, so getting over that ourselves, that it wasn't personal, they just left. Um, finding a volunteer management system that meets our needs and the ICT and privacy requirements for New South Wales State Government. So if anyone wants to go through the hoops for that, do, because we currently don't have one that works for us. Um, we can't procure it. And I'm um, realising the effort also that we would need to go to to reach residents within the communities in those high rises and the turkeys. <laughs> Oh, they'd like to add their layer and their handiwork to our project area. Very quickly, our learning. Um, many people are interested in engaging with the project. We can't implement every idea straight away. It's worth setting up our structure properly. We learned that from our network of volunteers in DPE. Uh, start how you want to keep going. Um, some volunteers will spend a short time with us, but we need to invest in them in their training and their induction anyway, because they will go away as ambassadors if we do a good job. Um, suitable community volunteer leaders are going to take a long time to emerge, but leading volunteer leadership doesn't always mean organising. It can mean taking on a regular task such as watering the new plants every week for us. Uh, rain has positive and negative impacts. Um, we couldn't plant for a while because we thought we might drown the plants. Uh, pilot's a great idea and we can evolve our original idea with lots of grant variations and we can navigate through rules, rules and policies to create opportunities for volunteers to care for country. Um, our preliminary surveys have um, shown that the volunteers, we've surveyed them twice now, um, they've increased their knowledge on how the park is managed, up four points on a 10 point scale on average, and biodiversity, their knowledge on biodiversity and threatened species, ability to identify plants and animals, birds and weeds, and sources of rubbish, that's come up about two points on a one to 10 scale on average, so that's great. Um, 
but they also have indicated in their lovely comments that they feel valued and that what they're doing is positive and worthwhile. And to start this year off, we had um, one session already um, at, at this work site where 11 people turned up to assist. And we have about 60 people on our list who we engage with and let them know about opportunities coming up across the parklands. So we invite you to follow our project um, via the MySop Engage project page, or if you're a neighbour to the park, come and join us sometime. And thank you for the opportunity of sharing this project with you. Thanks so much, Fiona. That's such an interesting project, and it is. Uh, it just reminds me of that old Margaret Mead saying that never think that uh, small groups of committed people can't change the world. They're the only things that ever have. So thank you so much. It's great to see innovation in a program that's been around for a long time and continuing to find new pathways. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Robin Gulliver, who is a research fellow at ANU and the University of Queensland. So if you're ever lost today, like just, you know, <laughs> she's your woman. She will tell you where, where we're off to. Um, Robin is a multi-award winning environmentalist, writer and researcher who has served as an organiser and leader of numerous local and national environmental organisations. Robin's research focuses on the antecedents and consequences of environmental activism. She has developed one of Australia's largest databases of environmental groups and campaigns. So please join me in welcoming Robin today. Hello, thank you all for coming along to listen. It's a great um, pleasure of mine to be able to speak to you about environmental volunteering. Now, there's a lot to say about environmental volunteering, as I can imagine that you know, but today I'm going to focus particularly on leadership and organising. And what I want to look at in general is how we can determine the distinction between participation and leadership behaviours and what kind of psychological motivations drive people to engage in these behaviours. So I'm interested in the why. You know, we can create fabulous programs for volunteers, but we don't understand why they do it. They will not stay. And in the activism context, which I'll explain shortly, we will face very high rates of burnout. So that's why I think the why is really important. So these are what I'm going to briefly cover in the talk. Why do they matter? What is the difference between volunteer leaders and participants? An overview of a few series of studies that we're doing on the projects, some findings, and then some actual takeaways that hopefully, even if you're not in what we define as the activism space, these will still be really useful for you if you are volunteer managers of environmental groups. And the reason why I say that is because we know that we need more activism. We need more environmental volunteering. We're in a massive environmental crisis, which is worsening every day. So we need that activism, which is almost entirely voluntary. And we also need more volunteer managers and leaders. Now, even if you have just a very participatory model of your environmental volunteering, we all have constraints, right? If you're the only manager in your organization, you just can't grow. So we kind of all need volunteers to be able to step up take on other tasks with autonomy so that your programs can grow as well, even if you're not in the activism space. Okay, so what we know about environmental volunteering in general was the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission data, which is just organisations, of course, as you know, that are registered as charitable status. Um, we know that they're at that, this is a little bit old data, but I think it probably holds true today. Less than 1% of environmental groups actually have uh, paid staff, fascinating statistic. And we know of course that volunteers in the environmental sector are some of the smallest of the sector in total. But in general, they have very heavy reliance on volunteers and they also generate a lot of money if that's how we need to actually sell that to organisations. They do generate a lot of financial value. But none of this data includes organisations that do not have charitable status. And that is almost all activism organisations. Activism organisations are those that get volunteers to come in, do volunteering that seeks to change something. They want to change a law, they want to change a behaviour, they want to change an attitude. So that's distinct from behaviours where you might plant a tree. So in terms of those groups, almost none of them are registered charities. So 
First of all, I'm just going to look at what are the differences between participation and leadership behaviour. You may all be aware of this. The ladder of engagement generally splits into six categories. It's a useful framework. We've done a lot of statistical analysis on these types of behaviours, and we've found that generally from the observing, which is what I do when I lurk on a Facebook group, I'm just observing what the group's doing up to leading. When I start, for example, I start a local bushcare group, we know that those two, those six categories actually factor into two different types of behaviours. So by factoring, I mean they group, they group into participation behaviours, which is the bottom three, and leadership behaviours, the top three. So when I talk about leadership, I talk about those top three, and I think that was mentioned earlier as well. It doesn't mean just being the actual leader of a group. It also means organising an event or something. Okay, very quickly, so this is three studies we've looked at. The first one was we wanted to find out who are all these environmental groups that are not registered as charities and what do they do, where do they do it, how many volunteers do they have. We also did a survey of 259 volunteers, which was both activism and not activism, environmental volunteering behaviours. And then we were looking there as why do people do the participation, why do people do the leadership behaviours, what attracts them, and kind of what makes them want to stay. And then some interviews, which were specifically with environmental volunteer activist leaders. And I just wish we had a shorter name for that, but I have to say all four words, environmental volunteer activist leaders. And that was about what do they actually need to do what they do and how do they deal with the constant failure that they face every day. Okay, so now I'm going to go into the findings and then I want to spend quite a bit of time on the key takeaways from the so the findings of the first one, what are all these groups? Okay, they're all over the country. The numbers here are the number of groups in that spot. So for example, here, there's 66 known environmental groups just in that spot. And that engage, that includes everything from bush care groups, not land care groups. So land care groups and friends of groups, you know, the friends of parks and stuff, they're not generally included in this map. So you can add another, say, 5,000 for all of those groups. But these are primarily groups that will be engaging in some sort of advocacy. Um, and then what we also found is that a lot of groups don't have any formal organisational structure. So that means they're just people at home um, posting some stuff on Facebook, but they call themselves a group. They have people in their group and they do stuff. They may not advertise it wisely, but they exist widely, sorry. Um, and then also, key point here is that when we talk about activism in Australia, in general, we have a very strong negative stereotype about what an activist is. And we tend to, the research shows, we tend to associate that with people who might glue themselves to a road. Or they might, <laughs> they might put their car in front of the Sydney Tunnel. Right? And that's definitely, there is a type of activism doing that, and there will be more, and it's only going to get more and more extreme. But the vast majority of activism is not that behaviour. So think about, say, 98% of activist behaviour is other stuff trying to change things. So talking to your MP, or having a movie night in your community, or um, getting together and having a market stall to try to educate people about climate change. So that is what almost all of those groups do. There might be, say, six groups on that database who actually do illegal disruptive action. Turning to the survey now. So the survey, we were looking at why do people participate? Why do they take on leadership roles? And then also, why do they kind of sustain themselves over time? Now, the first bit refers to some statistical analysis. So we were looking at sort of psychological drivers associated with these behaviours. And what we found is that people who participate, there's a very, very strong, very well-established psychological driver for participation in any type of volunteering and activism, and that is identity. So they have to believe that they are the type of person who does this volunteering behaviour. So for me, if I... For example, I can tell you um, I'm functionally deaf, so I do identify as someone with a disability, but I would never go and volunteer for an environmental group with people who have physical disabilities that are visible and really impactful because I don't feel like I can speak for that. I don't identify as that, right? It's a major, major psychological driver. So people have to see themselves as the type of person who would be in your group. But leadership, leadership was very different. 
to take on those leadership roles, organizing and the um, helping manage things, they had to believe that they were capable of it. So self-efficacy is what we define it. So they have to believe, I want to start an environmental group. I believe I can start an environmental group. Like I can do it. And it seems silly, but this is why training and mentoring is so important for your organization because it's building people's sense of self-efficacy. So if you want people to step up into any type of leadership roles in your group, make them feel like they're capable of doing it. And that also includes capable, perhaps, of failing sometimes. And the last thing for this study was, why do people stay? Nothing to do with the environmental outcomes, really. Nothing to do with the fact that they had enough time. They did it because they like being in the group they're in. Okay, now, of course, it surrounds a whole lot of other things. Of course, they're doing something meaningful. But at the very, very basic level, they have to like being in their group. And I don't know how many of you uh, perhaps involved in activist groups, but that's actually that's actually a really big ask sometimes, right? So having long-term friendships, number one important thing. Right? Now we're going into the last study, which was the um, the interviews. And this is there's a very big theory called resource mobilization theory that says if you have resources, you'll be able to mobilize and you'll be able to do stuff and create change. What we found is actually with volunteer leaders, that's not the case. Most volunteer leaders don't want money because they don't have the capacity to actually manage it. They don't want more volunteers that they have to direct or train because they don't have the capacity to do it. What do they want most of all? A great social context. They want to be able to have fun. They want to feel respected, valued, and with people who are like-minded. They do want volunteers, definitely, especially because we need so much more grassroots action, but they need volunteers who already have skills to do stuff. And when you actually look at, you do surveys of environmental volunteer groups, a lot of people in those groups are highly skilled. We've got people in our groups who are past professors, right? They've been engineers, they're IT experts. The volunteer cohort is incredibly skilled, but so often it's easy to miss that. And then of course they need more time. So last thing, how do they overcome failure? I'm not sure if this is going to be relevant to the many of the groups here, but when you're in an activist group and you're all volunteer, it's really easy to give up, right? And you, when you don't see you're making any change at all. So how do they overcome it? What they would do most of all is say, okay, well, let's think about, say, the Stop Adani campaign. The Stop Adani campaign failed. The Adani coal mine is actually going ahead, but what did that campaign achieve in other ways, right? It mobilised tens of thousands of Australians. We had 200 Stop It Only groups. We got people involved and interested in coal, the coal issue. So they'd re-evaluate. So when you're looking at the outcomes of what your volunteers should be achieving, or if you're designing a program and you want to um, get those outputs, make sure you have a way of rejigging it. You know, they might fail. They'll probably fail at, I don't know, starting a new bush care group but perhaps they'll achieve at learning something individually or making one new contact who will go on to start a new group later. Again, emphasising the individual benefits. Okay, I've been in lots of groups that have completely failed, <laughs> completely failed at whatever activism we wanted to do, especially about climate change. But we had a really fun time, right? <laughs> That's why often when you drive past and you see people at a protest and you think, oh man, I wouldn't do that. But you see them laughing and smiling because they're having a fun time because that's often all there really is. <laughs> <laughs> and the last thing is they would change tactics. Now tactics, are obviously a word that refers specifically to activism. A lot of people who start on those really disruptive tactics, they're vilified, they're criminalized, they're, they're abused, a lot of abuse. And over time, they might change tactics to something that's a bit more tangible, and particularly things like renewable energy or, or going to bush care and tree planting. So that's also a way of dealing with failure. Right, key takeaways in the last two and a half minutes. Um, that first thing I want to really emphasize, that shared identity is the number one most critical driver across all the research about why people will engage in volunteering and activism in particular. So think about, um, it's probably really obvious to you, but I spend most of my working days looking at websites from groups that are wanting volunteers or voluntary led, and often I just, I see myself, I'm a white, middle-aged suburban woman. I don't see anybody else. I particularly don't see people with disabilities often. And I also um, don't see perhaps, 
for activism, the type of tactics that I might feel comfortable in. So identity is encapsulated in a lot of different ways. It's encapsulated, of course, as a picture of people on your website, but it's also the things you advertise. So Extinction Rebellion is a very good example here. Okay, We may associate Extinction Rebellion with really disruptive protests, but Extinction Rebellion runs over 5,000 events every year, and maybe 10 of those are actually disruptive illegal protests. Most of them are self-care, learning, doing stuff about climate change in your home. You have to see yourself in those tactics as well, especially with activism, because we need to overcome that negative stereotype about who does activism. Okay, again, that social aspect. In a way, sometimes I think, don't even worry about, I know if you pay, if you've got organizations, you have to deliver outputs, right, from your volunteers. But if you're a voluntary led organization, don't even worry about what you're actually achieving from an environmental point for the first six to 12 months. Just make a team. Make a team that enjoys being together and is not clicky, right? So that other people will come in and immediately feel welcomed as well. So we would have, for example, in groups, um, we had a big Stopadani Brisbane group and sometimes it got quite big and people would come in, you'd see them come into the meeting and then they'd leave quickly afterwards and nobody talked to that person. Nobody really said hello or asked their interest. And, you know, I, I'm just, it's very hard for volunteer leaders to do this, but you have to. It's the number one important thing. Don't worry about what you achieve. Just try to keep them involved and welcomed. And the last one is that self-efficacy thing that's particularly important for, um, for if you want volunteers who want to take on more autonomous roles. So think about how you can um, give them more time by taking time loaded tasks away from them. So that's why the share the load thing is you could do the boring stuff for them while they can have more time to do the group building and also make sure there's a lot of organisations out there that actually can help with the training and mentoring. I'm sure you guys are across that. But that would be my third takeaway to actually help people build their confidence. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'll also just point out that um, I'm a board co-director of the Common Social Change Library. It's Australia's only online uh, library about social change, which has also got volunteering stuff, all freely accessible. We're very interested in doing more research projects or um, sort of on the ground projects with environmental groups or organisations interested in social change. So please just do get in contact if you have any questions. We'd love to get in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. It was so interesting to hear and there's certainly a theme emerging about the need to train and develop and mentor your volunteers so they can step up into those leadership, perhaps not the formal leadership roles, but those leadership roles within the teams that can then help to leverage and expand the programs. It was fantastic to have all that information on the evidence base that underpins that as well. Thank you so much. And our last speaker today is uh, Katie Ronald. So Katie has been in volunteer management within the conservation sector for over 10 years. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Management and Conservation Biology and a Certificate for in Coordination of Volunteer Programs. Katie now works as the National Volunteer Program Coordinator for Bush Heritage Australia and lives in Perth with her family. Please join me in welcoming Katie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So today I want to start with a story about how I got into volunteer management in the conservation sector. In my first industry job in 2011, I worked in operations for a not-for-profit. I managed environmental projects that volunteers could get involved with around the Perth local area, and I loved it. It was logistics, which I found I was quite good at. Uh, I was in the loop about conservation outcomes in my local area, so it appeased my training. And like most of us working in the not-for-profit sector, um, I felt like I was making a difference in giving back to my community. And then our volunteer engagement officer left the organisation. And then we had funding cuts. And then our national office put a freeze on hiring. Is anyone here starting to sound a bit familiar to anyone? Yeah. So uh, our team of six was currently down to three, was down to three all of a sudden. And we uh, had a meeting to work out what we were going to do after the shock had worn off. The conclusion from my manager, 
you've been doing project management, here, take on the volunteer program as well. I didn't have any background knowledge of the volunteering sector. Sure, when I was in the field working alongside volunteers, I knew what my duty of care responsibilities were, but a volunteer role description, what's that? The National Standards for Volunteer Involvement, sorry, never heard of those. I fell into the field of volunteer management, also not truly, un truly understanding the complex relationships that volunteers can have with the organisations that they volunteer for. On top of that, I was facing really re unique challenges managing volunteers in conservation. And every sector has those challenges that are unique to, that are only unique to them. In aged care and in disability services, you're dealing with vulnerable people. In sport volunteering, you might have to manage overly enthusiastic parents. In emergency services, you're dealing with trauma and high tension situations. And in mine, I'm sending volunteers out into the bush. I'm now facing how do I manage volunteers in the WA heat with snakes, using hand tools and spraying chemicals. So I thought, well, I need to talk to the experts in this field. I need to talk to other volunteer managers and see how they are managing these challenges. So I reached out to Volunteering WA and I started attending their volunteer manager networking meetings. The agendas promised like-minded organisations, training opportunities, guest speakers, resource sharing. Was I in heaven? Were all my problems so easily solved? Suddenly I was surrounded by experienced, knowledgeable people and I made some great contacts who I still work with today and some of you are in this room. But they were in the health sector. They were in arts or in education. There were so many great people to talk to about those broad volunteer topics, like those national standards. Who was I going to talk to about snakes, hand saws and chemicals? 12 years on, things are a little bit different. I now work for Bush Heritage Australia and I manage the National Volunteer Program and I have those national standards firmly embedded in what we do. But it was only through trial and error and a very steep learning curve that I got there. I've worked for Bush for about two and a half years now, and like my volunteer management career, Bush Heritage also started from humble beginnings when our founder, Dr. Bob Brown, purchased our first property in Tasmania in 1991. And that's what we do. We buy and manage land and we partner with Aboriginal people so that we can protect our irreplaceable landscapes and our magnificent native species forever. We respect, listen and learn from working side by side with traditional owners and working in partnership with pastoralists and other organisations. Together, we're returning the bush to good health. And we've grown our volunteer program significantly over the last 30 years to match that. So we see ourselves not only as a leader in landscape scale conservation, but also as a leader in volunteer coordination in the environment. And as a large, well-resourced organisation, we have a responsibility to help and support other not-for-profits in our sector. And this is where the idea of the Volunteer Coordinator Support Forum came from. So today I'm going to be telling you a bit about setting up a forum like this, why we felt it was needed in our sector, and whether it might help yours. How great would it be if you had a forum specific to your sector, a forum that brings together volunteer managers from different organisations within the same industry who are looking for additional support or want to receive mentorship from another organisation. A forum that provides a collaborative and safe environment where volunteer managers are comfortable raising issues or concerns that they have specific to volunteer management in their sector. For me, it was things like, how do I manage volunteers and firearms? Or how do I check the manage the competency of a volunteer using a tractor? And the forum has to be a place where we can go to to share resources, ideas and knowledge. I wanted to know what policy other organisations were using having around chemical use or what the best induction template was for remote field work. So to be relevant, the first thing we needed to look at was if it was needed. Bush Heritage is a large organisation and over the length of our volunteer program, we get asked a lot by other organisations for advice and support. The top things that we get asked are, how do we manage our volunteer data? How do we manage problematic volunteers in remote areas? How do we keep our volunteers safe and what systems do we use? 
Can we share our policies, procedures and guidelines, which we do with a lot of organisations? And how do we deal with conflict between staff and volunteers when our volunteer supervisors are in remote locations? So this indicated that to us, there was a need in our sector for this support. We then had a look around to see if anyone else was doing this, and we came across the Environmental Volunteer Managers Forum in Victoria. They held a two day forum towards the end of 2021 and they wanted to provide a space to share training opportunities and resources across the different programs, connect different offerings and just get to know each other a bit better. And they had a really great uptake and it was a great couple of days. The forum was organised by the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning's Environmental Volunteer Action Group. And the need came from this forum from government departments needing to improve the communication uh, with each other about their environmental volunteering opportunities. But the forum was a one off. It was only in Victoria and it was state government led, not led by not for profits who again have our own challenges. So next we looked at the content. We knew that the agenda had to be participant driven. We already know that volunteer managers are time poor, that we usually do different jobs throughout the organisation and most of us work part time. The content has to be meaningful and engaging and not take up too much of that precious time. Four years ago, our workplace health and safety manager found herself in a similar position that our volunteer program finds itself in today. She was constantly being asked by another, other not-for-profits for advice on safety related matters. So like us, she thought that Bush Heritage needed to provide leadership in this space. So she started a quarterly forum for work health and safety managers of conservation organizations. They needed a safe place where they could come to to ask questions. They wanted to benchmark themselves against other organizations in the industry. And at the beginning of each year, the members are surveyed for topics that they want to discuss or guest speakers that they want to hear from. So the agenda is driven by the members. Specific forums for different sectors can also go be a place we can go to to problem solve. Other organisations can relate to the situation you are in and help you with the problem that you're trying to solve without needing to know the individuals that you're talking about. It's also a great place to be able to network, but if you're investing a time in a forum like this, you also want tangible outcomes. <laughs> 12 years ago, I wanted to learn about how other volunteer coordinators were managing total fire ban days or how they were rewarding and recognizing environmentally conscious volunteers who don't want certificates or material merchandise. Instead of spending hours researching or waiting for internal staff to get back to me who had their own priorities, I could have called on local contacts in my sector for advice. The next thing we looked at was the setting, the culture and the mood of the forum. It had to be meaningful to make good use of everyone's time. Almost everyone experienced working during home, working at home during lockdowns. But Bush Heritage have had staff working remotely for years. Our reserve staff are in remote areas all over Australia. So why do our support staff have to be together in an office in a capital city? We're also spread out all over the country. So we have the resources already in place for an ergonomic home office. We have risk assessments for working from home and we have an amazing employee assistance program, which includes a quarterly phone call from a psychologist just to check in about working from home, working remotely. We are in such a lucky position to be able to provide a safe and collaborative environment to our staff. Why shouldn't we be sharing what we know with other not-for-profits as well? And what about debriefing on volunteer matters? Who in this room has someone impartial that they can go to to debrief with about a difficult situation in volunteer management? Not many hands going up. We know you need to debrief after an event. During after the Black Summer fires in 2019, 2020 and during the pandemic, Bush Heritage staff had extensive and varied support from our board, our executive team, our people safety and culture team and our employee assistance program. But at a volunteer coordination level, do we always have someone that we can go to to debrief about our struggles? Like after we've had to manage a challenging volunteer behaviour or if we've had to exit a volunteer from our program. My team sometimes feels alone in this space. And if you're feeling the same way, maybe your volunteer program sits just outside your organization's main structure, or your reporting lines don't quite fit in with everyone else's and your line manager doesn't really understand the work that you do, or that other staff just don't understand that working with volunteers is very different to working with other paid staff and it presents its own set of challenges. 
My predecessor came from a social science background. Like a lot of people in that area, she started her career working in community support programs. But when she started with Bush Heritage, she suddenly found herself surrounded by scientists and land managers in a new sector. In her first week working at Bush, she was asked to recruit volunteers to complete a Macropod SCAP survey. Having no experience in natural resource management or in conservation, she had to Google what a Macropod was and what a SCAP was. And then she thought, how the hell is she gonna find volunteers who wanna count kangaroo poo? Her social science skills were completely transferable to the volunteer coordination space. But if she had had a network group to turn to for support, she would have felt more grounded in her role a lot sooner than she did. If we want volunteer coordinators to attend forums like this, we need to understand how time poor they are. Toby Johnson and Latrobe University found in their 2021 volunteer managers report that less than half of volunteer <coughs> coordinators devote 75% or more of their time to volunteer management. With the time that we do have, we need content that is meaningful, useful and engaging and brings coordinators wanting, come, wanting to come back. Which leads me into capacity building. Have you found that training opportunities or guest speakers in your organisation are targeted at what your core business does? I mean, it makes sense. At Bush Heritage, we have guest speakers who are scientists, who are climate change experts or fire management professionals. But with a sector specific forum, you can have guest speakers talk about the trends and issues in volunteering that occur just in your sector. The forums can host guest speakers that you wouldn't usually get within your own organization. And it's a great source of personal development and career growth for you as well. And you can start to use the knowledge in the forum to build your own case studies that you, you can then take back to your management to advocate for change within your own program. And who wants to be reinventing the wheel? when we can be sharing guidelines, policies, procedures, survey templates and research and strategies. If a larger organisation already has a data management system in place or they've already written a COVID policy or recruitment strategy, why not tap into that? Well, it's just a place where you can go to to debrief with people who know the common, your common challenges and who face the same struggles. Volunteer coordinators from some sectors face really unique challenges in volunteer management. A quarterly forum specifically designed to support and educate them within their sector will provide better outcomes for the volunteer coordinator, for the organisation and for their volunteers. So could this model benefit your sector? And if you're in conservation, come and talk to me. And who will lead this in your sector? Which organisations are going to stand up? We don't come together like this often. Use the conference to find those people. Use, the, use this conference to find those people in your sector and the networking opportunities to find people in the room who share the same sector specific challenges that you do. And identify those larger, well-resourced, well-established organisations in your sector who have the responsibility to be leading this initiative. I want to take you back to that young volunteer manager who was just looking for other people to talk to about managing volunteers in the conservation sector. How great would it have been if I had had a place filled with my peers who understood and appreciated the challenges around managing volunteers in the bush? Imagine if every single one of us had that support, that next level down from the peak bodies that was specific to our industry. For any sector, a forum like this can provide a place to go to when you're not sure who to go to within your own organisation or you don't have anyone to go to internally. Most importantly, forums like this can offer volunteer managers that safe space with like-minded people who are there to help them tackle those challenges like snakes, hand sores and chemicals. So I encourage everyone, stop waiting for these forums to be built, start networking and be that catalyst to help develop a more collaborative community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. And could I ask all the speakers to come and join us? I think we've got time for one or two questions. Um, it was a great call to arms yeah. there for us all, Katie, to use the conference to get to know each other and the people in this room, I'm sure, have a lot in common. So if you have a question, would you be able to put your hand up and I'll repeat the, um, the question for the live stream. Anyone have a question for our panel? Yes.
In your experience, you said you ever come across a right way or a procedural way that you engage? Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a really good question. So the question was really about engaging First Nations people um, in the work of an organisation and whether there's an appropriate way or people uh, have an approach in terms of identifying um, who that representative or the custodians of the lands could be. Does anyone want to take start with that question? Thank you. It's yeah, it is uh, like you mentioned, it's the timing. Um, it's all about the relationship that you have with that community. Um, as most of you know, there's generally not a word for volunteering in a lot of language. It's just service is what they do. It's part of who they are. So it's understanding that to start off with and understanding that what they might want to do for volunteering might be different to what the Western idea of volunteering is as well. Uh, but it is just about relationship building, um, knowing the right person to go to within the community, which is just going into that community in the first place, starting that conversation, starting to build that relationship um, and just see where it goes from there. It can be uh, can take a longer time in some communities. Some communities just aren't there yet. They're not ready yet. And they will tell you there's like, we're not at that stage yet where we want to be engaging with other organisations. So it's also listening to that, respecting that, and then coming to them when they're ready. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions before we move for lunch? Yes. Last question. Thank you. So the question was about family-based volunteering in the environmental sector, um, particularly attention to child safe organisations. I'm just wondering if anyone would like to have a go at that. Thanks, Fiona. Um, with our Neighbours Nurturing Nature program, we allow families to attend with their children so long as they're supervising their children um, and they're with their children all the time. So that's the best way we can approach it in that setting, making sure it's child safe. All our staff obviously have working with children checks in place as they're called in New South Wales. Uh, we also will incorporate this year into our school holiday offer a junior ranger neighbours hybrid where families can register for sessions with children and participate in them with just their children so other community volunteers would only be present if we've cleared them to be there to help the ranger. So we would, might have one or two, but not the whole general group. But that's the way we're, we're tackling it at the moment. Thank you very much. Sorry, Bob. Um, I'd just add as well that I totally agree and they're great programs to get kids involved, but also it's obvious, but your, your activities have to be at a family friendly time. And for a lot of activism organisations, they have meetings at 6 p.m. Or I would take my kids when they were young and, you know, there'd be embarrassment and, um, <laughs> And it's, it's just, you don't go back, right? So decide whether you want kids anyway. And if you do, make it family friendly, actual context for them. Mm. Very practical advice there. We will have to close then, but we are moving to lunch at the QT building. So that lunch starts in 15 minutes. So there's time to move. Please join me in thanking our speakers today.